Welcome to EJB Talks, Rutgers Blaustein School Experts in Policy, Planning, and Health, where we talk with our faculty and staff experts, as well as students, about how the fields of public policy, urban planning, public health, health administration, and public and urban informatics affect your lives. Welcome to EJB Talks. I'm Stuart Shapiro, the Interim Dean of the Edward J. Blaustein School of Planning and Public Policy. And typically, this podcast, uh, I speak with our faculty and our alumni and what they are doing to change the world in the areas of planning, policy, and health. But today, as our season concluding episode for season eight, we're going to have one of our regular politics check-ins where I'm going to be the guest and Amy Cobb, who usually serves as a producer, will step in front of the glass and ask me a few questions about the Trump arraignment and everything else that's going on. Amy, welcome back. Oh, it's been a while. Uh, (laughs) We've had an exciting season with some awesome new faculty. And uh, we were like, oh, well, maybe we'll do a politics one. And this one just fault landed in our lap. This is a good, <laughs> this is a good one. So uh, let's discuss this elephant in the room. Let's talk about the indictment and all the arrests. So, yeah, it is um, it is an exciting week for people that have been waiting for this for for years. Um, And but it is just a step in the process and probably what will likely be looked back on as not the most significant step. But that said, we shouldn't minimize it for the first time in American history a former president was indicted for a felony. Um, And that's a big deal. Uh, And that's never happened before, as I said. And um, it sort of speaks to where we are right now in our political dialogue, our our place right now. Um, And what happens from here? Well, I guess we should go on and talk about that. (laughs) Yeah. So, um, you know, just as a review, and I know there was a lot of discussion about why, why the indictment, why this particular indictment, and what are the charges um, that he's currently facing? And um, is this a gateway to possibly charging him with more serious things in the future? So one of the mistakes that people make is, and this happens across the political spectrum, and but right now you're, of course, hearing it more from the right, is that there's a big plan, you know, that we'll do this indictment, then this indictment, then that indictment. That's not how the, the, this works. There are separate cases, and in each case, the prosecutor, in this case Alvin Bragg, um, makes a decision based on, of course, some political factors, but primarily on his what he thinks to be the likelihood of securing a conviction before a jury. Um, This case is the one that uh, rises from the payments by Michael Cohn to Stormy Daniels to suppress the story that she and... uh, Uh, Donald Trump had an affair prior to the 2016 election. Um, The story was about to come out in the waning days of the campaign. Um, Cohen made a $130,000 payment to Daniels. Nothing Uh, to sneeze at. No, no. Um, And uh, and Cohen served time for that. Right. But um, until now... um, Donald Trump had not been held responsible or accused of participating in a crime um, in the uh, in in the payment to Daniels. Now, where it gets confusing is what is the crime here? Because you know you can pay someone one hundred thirty thousand dollars to be quiet if you want. I mean that's right. it's tawdry, it's uh, it's salacious, it's all those things. Um, but it's it's not illegal. And so um, if Bragg was going to charge Trump with a misdemeanor, 
he'd have a relatively easy case in front of him. Um, certainly falsifying business records um, would be, uh, I think, an easy misdemeanor conviction uh, for the president, uh, for the former president. Um, but in order to make it a felony, the purpose of falsifying those business records has to be attached to another crime. And the primary crime that Bragg is accusing Trump of is campaign finance violations. Although what we found out on Tuesday is that he is also accusing him of tax violations. Right. Um, And so the jury will have to find that Trump is guilty both of falsifying the business records, probably not a heavy lift for the prosecutor, but also guilty of the underlying felony charge um, or the underlying crime that would make this a felony. Um, And that will be a harder lift for the prosecutor for sure. So, you know, I keep hearing, you know, these aren't really big charges. Why Why are they doing this? And the DA basically said, Nobody's above the law. And I think this has been a discussion since before um, Trump became president um, about, you know, the precedent is everybody is speaking about it like, well, it's not a big deal, but, you know, nobody's above the law. Um, So, you know, can you speak a little bit about why in particular, you know, what's the what's the end game of continuing to say that, that this shouldn't be a big deal, that, you know, people do this all the time, that they want people to look back in other other political campaigns, you know, or, you know, is it just a matter of this is just another way for smoke and mirrors for the Republican Party to make it look like, you know, this is completely political? So if I had my druthers, um, <laughs> and I haven't used the word druthers in a long time, but it's um, very professorial. By it, the way. it is. It is indeed. Um and uh, I tell my students, no more of that tomfoolery from you. <laughs> um, so um, if, if I did have my druthers, though, obviously the more serious things that Trump is accused of would have come first. Um, but like I said, this, this isn't a plan. These are separate jurisdictions and separate um, crimes. I think of the four indictments that we expect to be brought against Donald Trump over the next six to nine months, This is the least serious of them, Mm -hmm. Um, and it is probably the one for which the case will be the hardest to prove. So it's not a great thing rhetorically for opponents of the president that this came first, but it just did. It's the first one to have occurred, right? This occurred in before the 2016 campaign. And so the New York uh, prosecutor's office has been on this for a long time. It's not surprising they were ahead of everyone else. Um, And the other cases, while the evidence may be stronger, particularly on the felony piece, they're complicated and they're a big deal. Um, and just to run down the other three indictments that we expect to happen, um, there is the case in Georgia regarding the 2020 election, the phone call to Brad Raffensperger, can you find me 11,000 right. votes, the plot to try and get a, a fake slate of electors appointed in Georgia. Um, that's being brought by the Fulton County prosecutor um, in in Atlanta. Um, In that case, a special grand jury was convened and they found that there was likelihood of criminal behavior, but now she has to convene a regular grand jury in order to bring indictments. And so that's a little bit tougher for them down there. Yeah. And we're, we're a few months away from that. I'm, I'm almost positive that will happen. Yeah. Um, Okay. The other two cases are within the purview of Jack Smith, the special account uh, counsel appointed by attorney general Garland. Um, One of those cases is the documents case, the famous uh, many documents at Mar-a-Lago that were classified that shouldn't have been removed from the White House. Um, That case, um, 
is before a grand jury, as is the January 6th uh, Trump's role in the riot at the Capitol on, uh, and the insurrection on January 6th. Um, I am certain there will be indictments brought on the documents case, particularly regarding obstruction of justice, as well as violations of the, uh, of the Records Act. Um, I'm almost positive, although there's a smidge of doubt about Trump's role in January 6th. Um, but that's, that, that might take the longest because that's the case where, The special prosecutor will want to interview the most people. The resistance will be highest. We just heard yesterday that Vice President Pence has agreed to talk to uh, a grand jury or testify before a grand jury in that case. Um, So these four are all coming. The other three are bigger in terms of their impact on on American democracy. Um, But... um, They're more complicated. They happened later. And so they didn't come out as fast as the New York case did. Right. And so, you know, we go to that, you know, is Trump going to be indicted on inciting a riot um, and inciting the insurrection? Um, But he was just told when he was being arrested that he could not incite any violence towards (laughs) the district attorney. And he just went about and did it anyway. However, um, I know there were protests, um, but. Do you feel like, thankfully, they were a bit more lackluster than people had thought? Um, Do you think people are just confused about this particular arrest because it's actually kind of, I hate to say boring, but it's just more about something a lot of people don't really pay attention to? Um, What were your thoughts on that? I mean, I was thankful it it didn't seem to be as violent as I I was worried it would be. So, you know, I think for all the passion that Trump inspires in his supporters, they all know that hundreds of people have gone to jail for January 6th. Mm -hmm. And how many of them are willing to risk their freedom to go out and protest for Trump? Um, Now, maybe if he gets sentenced um, in one of these cases, and has to go to jail. And of course, we've got a lot of appeals between now and then. And so then maybe you will see something like that. Um, Maybe in connection with the 2024 campaign, I would be surprised if it is entirely free of violence. Um, uh, It dismays me to say. Um, But this event was not something people were willing to go to jail for. Now, in terms of Trump, fomenting violence in response to this, the judge was very clear um, that he shouldn't do that. And really, I think then it becomes a battle between Trump's self-control. I think in the back of his head, he knows he puts himself in additional legal danger if he does that, um, and his impulse to do exactly that, which is to say what's on his mind. Um, And with Trump, those impulses almost always seem to win. Um, and so it wouldn't surprise me if he can't control himself and does try to get uh, supporters to rally for him. But I'm not sure that people are going to go to jail for this. Um, and we will we will see. But that doesn't mean you won't have a lone wolf do something crazy at right. some point. And that's that's indeed worrisome and, and scary. Yeah, we've we've definitely been through a lot. Um, so here's another question, because even <laughs> even though it's only 2023, we're already talking about the presidential election and some people who have, you know, declared that they're going to enter the race and, you know, other people that are kind of, you know, vacillating and not really saying anything, particularly in the Republican Party. So what are your thoughts about these candidates who and possible candidates who kind of have remained relatively quiet about what's happening. I mean, they've maybe some people have spoke, but they haven't been as uh, vocal as perhaps others had thought they would be. Um, um, what are your thoughts on that? And um, also, same question about Biden um, himself. So, yeah, definitely different situations for the president and for uh, Trump's Republican opponents. Trump's Republican opponents find themselves on the horns of a dilemma. They are running against Trump, 
And at this point, I believe it's just Nikki Haley, Asa Hutchinson, and that uh, entrepreneur whose name escapes me at the moment. Who's running. <laughs> I don't remember him either, uh, if that tells uh, you anything. <laughs> but of course, uh, the, uh, the elephant in that room is Ron DeSantis, who has not yet declared that he is running. The dilemma that these people face themselves with is they are running against Trump. Um, but they will need Trump's supporters to get the nomination. And so they are trying to walk a line whereby they attack Trump's prosecutors. All of them have um, made the veiled anti-Semitic comments about George Soros financing Alvin Bragg um, and complained about Bragg in ways that certainly touch upon racism and, and, and such, not as explicitly as Trump has done so himself, of course. But they've right. attacked the prosecutor um, and they have barely mentioned their opponent, the former president. Um, and they're trying to walk that line. And I can understand that for now. But the fact of the matter is, right now they are still playing Trump's game. Yeah. Um, they are you know, deferring to him. They are essentially acknowledging his leadership role in the party. And you don't beat him by doing that. Right. At some point... Someone is going to have to say, um, look, we love Donald Trump. He did great things for this country. Just as a qualifier, I'm not saying that. I'm saying a Republican will need to say that. But he is under indictment in X number of jurisdictions. He may, because of these awful prosecutors, be found guilty. And he cannot beat President Biden vote for me instead. And the question is, when do you say that? And who is the first to say it? Um, Chris Christie has been on TV, essentially, making that argument, although it's not clear yet that he is running for president. But he, um, someone will have to say that if they want to win. Otherwise, I can guarantee you Donald Trump will be the nominee for the Republican Party. Yeah. The person that successfully makes that argument has a chance, not a, you know, not a huge chance, but has a chance of defeating Trump. Now, those candidates may be sitting around and waiting and saying the time isn't right yet. There are more indictments coming. It's right. early. Like you said, it's still April of 2023 as we're talking here. And so it's not yet the time to make that argument. You don't want to shoot till you can see the white of his eyes. If you come at the king, you got to kill the king. All of those, uh, all of those uh, folksy uh, sayings apply here. Um, and so they may smartly be waiting until Trump is in more trouble than he's in right now before making that argument. But if they, are, if they wait too long, they will lose the opportunity to make it. So they have to be careful about that. Now, as for President Biden, Biden gains nothing by talking about Trump, right? right? He just calls attention to his predecessor, to his most likely opponent in the 2024 election. Um, he wants to separate himself so that the proceedings are seen as, a, as apolitical as possible. And so it is not in Biden's interest to say anything besides we will let the courts decide, we will let the legal system decide. This is not about me and Trump. It's about the legal system. And I would expect that that's all Biden would say until well into 2024. Right. So, and speaking of this um, and Biden and others, um, Curious what your thoughts are about Biden and Biden running and where we really, what are the predictions about where we may be heading from here? Knowing that since 2015, um, absolutely anything can happen. Um, but I'm curious, you know, just from seeing the whole landscape and, you know, you, you worked in DC, you worked um, in and around policy for, for years. Uh, what what you could possibly see for Biden and a possible campaign and who you think would be the biggest competition for Biden. So Biden, you know, it's almost certain at this point that Biden's running. He hasn't said so yet, but every hint that we have is. And he and will how run. old is Biden again, Stuart? Biden is very old. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he will be 82 uh, during the campaign. And I so, mean, I don't want anybody to think that. I don't think everybody's capable, but that does make you a little nervous about 
yeah. his age and his capabilities. And um, that's, that's, that's and, a little worrisome. Yep. And indeed those whispers are going on among Democrats, but I can tell you this, and I've said this ever since the, the, the campaign started to take shape last year, no one's going to run. No Democrat's going to run against him. Um, right. I, mean, I know Marianne Williamson is declared, but she's, she's not a serious candidate. Um, and so you don't run against your own incumbent. It's political suicide for yourself. You're going to lose. Um, and, uh, and, and, and that's, that's all there is to it, frankly. And also for concerns, all the concerns about his age, your strongest candidate as a party is going to be the incumbent president. Right. Um, you're not going to have anyone that will be a stronger candidate than that. Um, if the economy tanks, if whether it's the debt ceiling crisis or the recent bank failures, um, if those things cause the economy to tank, no Democrat is going to be a strong candidate. If the economy thrives, um, as it might, um, then no can Biden will be a very strong candidate and difficult for any Republican to beat. If we're in that in between area, the question of who is Biden's strongest opponent comes up. It's not Trump. I mean, Trump comes with a myriad weaknesses. That's not to say he can't win. He certainly can win if he's the nominee of the Republican Party and some of those economic factors come into play. But he, in a case where it's a close call, a younger candidate without the baggage of Trump will be a stronger opponent for Biden. That's not to say Biden can't beat those people if he has good economic conditions and other factors uh, fall into place. Um, but uh, but right now we are with Biden as the Democratic nominee and Trump is the most likely but far from certain Republican nominee. Well, you know, it's always a pleasure to speak to you about politics, Stuart. <laughs> It's never, never boring. Never it hasn't boring. been boring since we started these uh, prior to the podcast when we were talking about your your book and these were inspired by your book, Not Normal, which, yep. boy, oh boy, I I don't know if we were ever truly normal, but I miss the old version of Not Normal. Than <laughs> well, lives. I will say one of the reasons we haven't had a political podcast um, up till now is, uh, is, is it's been four months of relatively normal. And the, yes. in, the indictment of the, uh, of the president and uh, of President Trump is certainly been uh, our first sign that things are about to get not normal again. And your dog Grover agrees. Yeah, no, he's out there barking. He really has strong feelings on this. Yeah, very strong feelings about it. Well, Stuart, I appreciate uh, us having a catch up on this. This is uh, going to head us into a summer, hopefully uh, a quiet summer for most things, except for former President Trump. Indeed, indeed. So thank you, Amy, for coming out and uh, and doing this. Um, thanks to Karen as well for her work in producing the podcast. I do have to give a special thanks and a special goodbye to Amy um, because she is leaving the Blaustein School for, for greener pastures. Uh, and uh, uh, we're very excited for her, but very sad to be, uh, to be missing her. Um, and we we will resume with the podcast in the fall. Um, so don't think this means the end of the podcast, but we this is the last episode of this season. And we will, unless there is an emergency, take the entire summer off. Um, <laughs> and we'll be back in the fall with a new season with lots of great guests. Thanks so much for listening and stay safe. <laughs>